for hundreds of years indians have hunted fished and made their homes along the banks of this mighty river the white man called it the columbia the indians called it the river wana the free one the boundless one In 1939, the building of the Grand Coulee Dam turned this once mighty river into a quiet, 160-mile-long lake, Lake Roosevelt. A lake which has covered up much of the history, culture, and beauty of the past, so that now there are only echoes of yesterday. It was in 1939 that Howard Ball of Spokane, Washington was entrusted by the Bureau of Reclamation to move hundreds of Indian graves to new burial grounds above the rising water level. Only picks and shovels were used to carefully find and remove the Indian remains. Most of the men that worked with Mr. Ball were Indians who took their work very seriously. The contract required us to have Indian labor and we hired Indians and in total we had 102 Indians working for us. I didn't have to fire an Indian and I did fire a couple of white men and they were great workers and, and uh, it, that was one of the pleasant parts of, yeah. the, of the whole project. During this time, the Indians in the area were led by a great chief, Chief James. Well, he was a man that I wish you could have known. He was tall and he was, uh, had the typical chief's look, a uh, very dignified sort of a person and very quiet sort of a person. I can see uh, why he was chief. And the story that was told to me then is something like this, that the Chief James was riding his, uh, driving his buckboard out uh, on the reservation and saw a group of, um, of people uh, pounding stakes and so forth and wondered what it was all about. And uh, they said, well, hadn't you heard? We're going to build a dam and we're going to flood this area. Well, uh, that was part of the reservation. Despite the cries and opposition of the Indian people, the Grand Coulee Dam began to take form. We were camped up above the dam. Um, it was before we'd actually taken the workers and we were out looking at locations. And we were on a hill up above when we first noticed the dam was the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. When this film was shot in 1939, the dam was nearly one-third completed. Gigantic cranes, nearly a block long, lowered 30-yard capacity buckets of concrete to the penstock openings of the dam. Gravel was taken from a hill about one mile from the dam by a series of conveyor belts. 
they were fortunate to have the gravel pit so close by. The 12 holes shown here were drilled to supply water to the reservoirs that today serves as a means of irrigating thousands of acres of crops in the Columbia Basin. Today, the Grand Coulee is a mighty dam, supplying power to major cities throughout the Pacific Northwest. It has also become a national recreation area enjoyed by thousands of tourists each year. As the dam progressed, tremendous preparations had to be made to prepare the land for the coming waters. Trees were logged off and hundreds of new roads were built above the estimated water line. Many homes were moved and others left behind to be covered. Many towns, like the town of Peach, simply ceased to exist. But one of the hardest places to say goodbye to was the beautiful Kettle Falls. And it was a, a beautiful river because of the country that it went through. First coming down from Canada and through the hills and, and then through the timberland and the desert country around Vantage and then uh, along into Oregon. It was especially beautiful up by Kettle Falls because it had a comparatively deep canyon there and uh, it was really quite a setting. Here, circular holes called kettles, some 10 to 12 feet deep, were formed by the flow of the River Wana for hundreds of years. They now lie silent under 130 feet of water. Archaeologists have unearthed evidence that people had been living at Kettle Falls for over 7,000 years. Indians from many different tribes gathered here from all over the Pacific Northwest to trade, hunt, and fish for salmon. For centuries, Kettle Falls was a center for these activities and served as a home and gathering spot for the Indians. This beautiful area and hundreds of miles of unique land are now gone, replaced by water. Where this picture was taken is where the water level is at today, revealing the beauty of the land, now below the waterline. Today, from the same location, it's hard to imagine what it was like back then. And Kettle Falls has also taken on another look. The Indian graves to new locations was a difficult project. Graves were removed from over 50 different locations covering an area of 160 miles. Boats were the only way to reach many of the remote grave sites. Wooden boxes were made at each camp area to hold the remains. As the crew carefully worked, Indians solemnly watched as the graves of their ancestors were opened. One man, Augusta Williams, who came to watch, 
was 104 years old when this picture was shot. He stands next to his wife. Uh, many of the legends or the stories that helped us, such as finding the graves on Kettle Falls Island, came from Augustus. As the work progressed, hundreds of artifacts were unearthed to become the property of the Indian people. Here is an old flintlock brought by the Hudson Bay Company. They found spangles, earrings, arrow sharpeners, onyx chisels, hide scrapers, copper spearheads and arrowheads. Augusta Williams is explaining the use of this breastplate in protecting the body from arrows. Many new cemeteries were established, like this one at Keller. Today, 40 years later, not much has changed from the day it was first established by Mr. Ball. The Indians living in the area made the project a memorable experience. Many pitched their teepees next to the camps and followed the men about as they worked. Really enjoyable part of, of this project was getting with the Indians themselves and the families. They came by the hundreds to watch and to enjoy each other's company. As the work commenced, it became more and more interesting. This bridge at Kettle Falls led to a small island which contained a very old Indian burial ground. Many Indians had rested at this location for four to five hundred years. Here the remains of a chief's baby were found, wrapped in buffalo robes and adorned with drilled elk's teeth and copper beads. A legend had been passed on that many years ago, hundreds of Indians had died from a smallpox epidemic. It was said whole families perished. Graves were unearthed with 10 to 12 people buried together, emphasizing the tragedy that had come upon this people and proving the legend to be true. And not far from this area, they came upon the scene of an Indian massacre. Right here, 13 white men, women, and children were killed by the Indians and put in one grave together. This man died from a tomahawk blow to the head. It was the story of many of the settlers who tried to establish homes in this area. The area was once abundant with many different species of wild animals. Mr. Ball found a friendly deer who liked to follow a group of children to school. Altogether, 1,388 graves were removed and carefully put in four new cemeteries above the rising water. As the project drew to a close, the water began to back up. 
This bridge at Detillion on the Spokane River was soon to be covered by water. Indians in this area came to Kettle Falls for one last time to bid farewell to their fishing grounds and to reminisce. It was a sober, solemn occasion. Mr. Ball listened intently as the Indian people shared stories, experiences, and old legends about what had taken place on the shores of this mighty river for thousands of years. The River Wana, the free and boundless one. The salmon would never again be seen here, and the water is now still, covering up the history, culture, and beauty forever. Only the echoes of yesterday remain. The great father above is a shepherd chief. I am his, and with him I want not. He throws out to me a rope, and the name of the rope is love. And he draws me to where the grass is green, and the water not dangerous, and I lie down, satisfied. Sometimes my heart grows weak and falls down, but he lifts it up again and draws me into a good road. His name is wonderful. Sometime, it may be soon, it may be longer, it may be a long, long time, he will draw me into a place between these mountains. It is dark here, but I shall not draw back. I shall be afraid not for it is between these mountains that the shepherd chief will meet me, and the hunger I have felt in my heart all through this life will be satisfied. Sometimes he makes the love rope into a whip, but afterwards he gives me a staff to lean upon. He spreads a table before me with all kinds of food. He puts his hand upon my head, and all the tired is gone. My cup he fills till it runs over. What I tell is true, doubt not. These roads that are away ahead will stay with me all through this life. And afterwards, I will go to live in the big teepee and sit down with my shepherd chief forever. <laughs> 